which are the most effective channels of communication. This sort of analysis has to be done very early on. And if you don't do it thoroughly, you don't know how to reach people. And you don't know how to really persuade people. This is all about a positive form of persuasion. That's Ingrid Lehman talking about the critical first steps to consider when launching a media campaign on foreign soil. Ingrid spent 25 years working at the United Nations Secretariat in the Department of Public Information and in two UN peacekeeping missions. Ingrid has an MA in History from the University of Minnesota and an MA in Doctorate in Political Science from the University of Berlin. She was a fellow at the Center for International Affairs at Harvard University, a researcher at Yale University's UN Studies program, and a fellow at Harvard University's Shorenstein Center on the Press, Politics, and Public Policy. She's the author of Peacekeeping and Public Information, Caught in the Crossfire, and Managing Public Information in a Mediation Process, and has published numerous articles about international political scandals, the role of media in international negotiations, and peace communication. Ingrid now lives in Salzburg, Austria, where she's been teaching the Department of Communication Science at the University of Salzburg. I'm Warren Hoffman, and in this episode of Conflict, Power, and Persuasion, we'll be looking at the use of media by the UN in peace processes. We talk about the genesis and evolution of media campaigns as a tool in UN peace operations, the Burhimi Report, General Dallaire, radio jamming in the Rwandan genocide, how media can ultimately affect policy, the essential first steps for launching a media campaign on foreign soil, major challenges in media campaigns, addressing rumors, gaining trust, and much more. This is Conflict, Power, and Persuasion podcast of the Canadian International Institute of Applied Negotiation. Hi, Ingrid. Thanks for joining me. Yeah. Hi, Warren. Can you give us a brief overview of your professional career and uh, your research interests? Okay. Well, my professional career was mostly uh, with the United Nations Secretariat for uh, two and a half decades. And I worked in a combination of political and public information functions, starting at the age of 26 after a competitive exam, I joined the UN and made it straight away into the Secretary General's office. And um, as a junior uh, officer there, I really had a pretty good um, insight into how the organization works and its shortcomings. And then um, later on moved um, into a variety of political functions, such as in the Department for Disarmament Affairs, and also in two peacekeeping missions. And that was probably my formative phase, uh, working in the field, away from headquarters. And uh, the first one was in Cyprus for a year. And the second time was over a year spent in what is now Namibia, then still a territory uh, run and dominated by South Africa. So um, my research interests are on one hand linked to that. And I've written a book about uh, peacekeeping and public information caught in the crossfire and several articles about that similar subject. And in general, I think my research interests are in the relationship between media politics, in this case, international relations, international politics, and international public opinion as far as it exists. And we can talk about that later if you wish. So um, I have a degree in political science and a degree in history from the University of Minnesota. And then later on, much later in my in life, I um, also got a PhD in international relations from the University of Berlin which is the town where I'm originally from. Thank you. I can, I can only imagine it had to be an amazing experience jumping right into the Secretary General's office at the age of 26. As I understand, you, you also set up and headed the Peace and Security Program section at the UN Department of Public Information. And I want to dig into the UN's use of media in peace process, but let's back up first to before the UN began to realize the importance of uh, strategically managing information in peace operations. Uh, Can you discuss how communication channels were being used by the parties to help propagate hate and violence? Well, let me give you two examples. Uh, My 
second peacekeeping mission, um, Namibia, the independence process leading to an independent Namibia as a sovereign country and no longer dominated by South Africa, which um, uh, since basically the 1930s had been uh, run by South Africa under a uh, League of Nations mandate. And there was the overall feeling that South Africa had misused that trust, betrayed the trust. Um, that rather large territory, Southwest Africa, was in many ways completely controlled by South Africa. They, they just ran the airwaves. They had apartheid-dominated political and media structures imposed on the country. Um, by South African broadcasting applied to the territory. And um, the, the whole apartheid system, of course, now in the past is, is something that a lot of people studied at the time and, and, and until it was overthrown in South Africa itself. So at the time when the UN mission in Namibia, which was the first mission of the second generation peacekeeping. You're familiar with that, right? First generation, the more traditional ones like Cyprus and um, the Golan Heights, etc., where the UN just basically provided a military buffer zone. And now we're uh, into a phase where large-scale political missions took place, and there were one after the other. Namibia was the first, and then Cambodia was another one a couple of years later. Mm -hmm. So here we had a rather, well, not gigantic, but 8,000 um, civilian and military and police uh, people involved. And they did not come unprepared. They, um, especially the political leadership of that UN Namibia mission, knew Southwest Africa and the uh, the way South Africa had dominated in the apartheid mode very well, because the UN took on the case of uh, the Southwest Afri African People's Liberation Front, et cetera. So there were numerous support organizations worldwide for the uh, Southwest African People's Organization. Most of them were abroad at the time, living in neighboring countries. And so everybody was pretty much aware of South Africa's propaganda system. And um, it was therefore pretty clear from the beginning that the UN, if it wanted to be successful in conducting this large scale political um, operation, it had to have its own information capacity, even though it wasn't ever really used before in that form. And it um, turned out to be uh, something that the political leadership of the mission, a man by the name of Marty Atasari and his uh, various assistants, wanted it very, very much so. And I was lucky enough to be in that uh, newly created peacekeeping information unit and was able to help them and set it up, the, the information program. So is that the specific situation that brought the importance of managing information in, in peacekeeping missions to the UN? Or, or was there a specific incident internally they said, okay, we need to control the no, information? No, no specific incidents because for years, if not decades, the UN had been trying to get South Africa to relinquish its control over that territory. There were wars going on on the border with Angola and the South Africans were deployed there. And eventually I think the South Africans, I mean, the white apartheid regime uh, got fed up with the costs it had to pay and they became agreeable to a transition. And we were, we meaning the UN, were the transition managers, if you wish. And we knew that information had to be a major part of it, not just because of the South Africans propaganda machine that was well oiled, but also because the population was largely uninformed as to what the UN was supposed to do there, what independence would entail. They'd never had a free election. They never had any elections. Uh, many of the people were not even registered as uh, citizens, as voters. They had no registration cards, nothing. 
And um, they were forced into a sort of ethnic, um, well, divide and rule system by the South Africans based on, on tribal organizations. And um, that, of course, also had to be overcome. So public information and education had to be major tools of convincing the population that this would be the end of a regime and the beginning of new self-determination. So this was a major information education effort. And um, it, in part, it used uh, you know, strategic communications uh, techniques because they were already being how shall I say, there were various reforms in always ongoing in the United Nations Secretariat. And in the um, uh, mid to late 80s, uh, actually a Canadian under Secretary General who came from a public relations firm tried to reorganize the whole department according to what she thought a public, uh, strategic public information um, office should do. And so they didn't start from scratch, fortunately, at that time. But still, you know, you need infrastructure, you need people, and you need to train people. And uh, fortunately, also, this Namibia mission set up training programs for staff that were in the first and second wave of UN and, and other civilian staff going there. So um, the, the, we didn't go in there with our eyes closed. And um, <clears throat> I'd been there twice before in Namibia and knew a number of people also in the opposition movement, whites and blacks that were sympathetic to the UN. So we knew what to watch out for. Mm -hmm. Okay, can you take us behind the scenes a bit into the UN during this period? Can you describe how that shift was made internally to adopt the strategic communication as a goal of the UN? Well, in the, you know, there were several attempts and in the uh, 1980s, it was extremely difficult. My then boss had a hell of a time. You know, she met resistance all over the organization mm -hmm. and she didn't get much support from the Secretary General's office. So uh, the reforms were sort of half done, but half not done. And the resistance was indeed very, very strong from the bureaucracy. So several years, you know, battles who would give more money to public information and what mandate should be given to whom, et cetera. This right. went on for several years. Wow. It um, Then uh, in the 1990s uh, experienced severe setbacks because under the new Secretary General Butrus Ghali, um, none of that was really taken up. He, he just didn't really care for the concept, I don't think. He, he thought that information was done by journalists. And if you got a journalist to write nice stories about you, that was about it. But And then also you had the terrible wars of the 1990s, which did, in my view, enormous damage to the um, image of the United Nations from Somalia to Rwanda to the former Yugoslavia. For, you know, for sometimes the wrong reasons. And in this concept that I have of scapegoating, the UN, you know, came in very handy as a scapegoat for the failures of the member states. Mm -hmm. um, but um, the 1990s, in a, in a way, mid-1990s were a setback. And it wasn't until Kofi Annan became Secretary General that the concept was taken up again. And by then, they'd learned from the earlier trials and tribulations of the 80s. So it was done by the Secretary General out of his own office. And he and his close advisors paid close attention to it. And then, of course, in, in the peacekeeping field, what happened is that the disasters of the 90s led to a major reassessment of the organization's capacity and its future orientation in the form of what later on became known as the Brahimi Report. Mm -hmm. It came out in, in the year 2000. And it's a, a complete, uh, very thorough assessment of what the organization is capable of and where it needs to be strengthened and where, you know, you have to watch out. And public information came in as one of the, the strong um, elements there. So, for a while, the new peacekeeping operations in the new uh, millennium then 
were equipped with the things that, say, the Rwanda organization, which, as you remember, was run by General Dallaire, uh, did not have. And um, so in that respect, people learn from the mistakes of the past. And all the new African organizations had major uh, broadcasting, mostly radio, uh, but some television programs as well which, of course, General Delea at the time missed sorely. He says he tried to get it, and he, of course, tried to get the, the hate radio that in, in Rwanda led to the uh, mass murder stopped. He advocated jamming the airwaves of the, the, the people who were, were, were broadcasting this, the, these hate messages, and he, th- that was refused, and he claimed it was bo- refused both by the UN and the Canadian government. So um, those failures, the people did review, and they then said, this cannot happen again. We have to, when we go in, we have to go in with a full information capacity. Mm. Can you explain uh, the hate radio? Why do you think it was refused? Well, it was refused by... Um, governments and the secretariat because it was seen as too interventionist and that that in itself would have led to further um, violence and that the Rwanda operation was a chapter six operation relying on the consent of the host country intervening in their radio capacities uh, was not seen as a, uh, you know, friendly act in that way. Several countries on the Security Council were opposed to it, Russia, I can't remember who, but uh, several countries were opposed to it. I think the United States too. Um, And it uh, just didn't happen. Now, it could have easily been done, I was told by colleagues who knew about this, um, but it wasn't done. It, I think there were several other Uh, occasions when it was discussed in other countries. And again, the people who thought that it might lead to further violence, that if the UN um, intervenes in this sort of direct manipulation of press and the the media in a country, it becomes not just a party to the conflict, but it also, in a way, goes against its own concept of a free, independent press. Um, has anyone evaluated the extent that the the hate radio um, contributed to inciting violence? Is 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 that some? Um... Yes. Okay. Yes, there were. I mean, in, in the U to the UN's credit, if that's the right word, but they 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 did have major um, evaluations and and reports about what went wrong and who had not done what, like who hadn't passed on. Uh, Dalia's messages to the Secretary General and things like that. These things all came out. And they are, I mean, there is a, in fact, I just looked at it in my library. There is a rather voluminous report um, analyzing what went wrong in the case of um, Rwanda. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. So if, if jamming airways isn't uh, an option, Perhaps later we might get into what strategies are used and would work. But let's let's start with getting an idea of the power of the media here. You you have created a model, the uh, I believe you call it the media opinion policy loop. And I'll try to get this visual um, up there so people could follow along. But can you just verbally walk us through there with the intent of sort of describing the the power of the the media in this situation? Well, this is something I, I did actually for my classes. I talked taught um, in the School of Communication at the University of Salzburg after I retired from the UN. Um, and I developed this media opinion policy loop as a sort of teaching tool. Uh, when a crisis breaks out around the world and the UN may or may not be involved in it, that, that crisis generates news. And some, of course, here comes in the... the the caveat, some crises generate a lot of news and some crises are almost totally overlooked. Right. And at, in the 90s, and even today, I would say many crises are sort of on the back burner of international uh, relations. Mm-hmm. They're there, but nobody really pays any attention to it because other items on the agenda seem to be more important. If you take Sudan right now, you know, this is a major setback that there was this coup in Sudan after yes. 
you know, um, elections and a turn towards democracy and not that much reporting really about it. I don't know about Canada, but... Um, yeah, I came across my radar, but um, I, yeah, I don't think yeah. I got much attention now. Yeah. And um, so some crises get a whole lot more attention than others. That's the first thing. So let's say a crisis that generate a lot of news through media reporting and through, um, you know, the various so social media channels, then that growing awareness of the crisis can become a driving force and clearly can affect public opinion. Now, public opinion is sometimes used very generally and very superficially. I think public opinion has actually several components. There is local public opinion in the crisis area in the country itself. There is um, regional public opinion, how the neighboring countries respond to a particular crisis. They may even be part of the conflict, the neighboring countries, or they may have large scale refugee populations from that crisis area. So they're clearly affected by it. That's already two different levels, local, regional. Then there is the um, international level of the UN or other international organizations that play a role there. They're usually humanitarian uh, organizations. And then what we always thought was totally overlooked is how do the people who are in the crisis area, who are not locals, the internationals, how do they get their information about it? So there is this component of internal information flow within a mission area that in the past was also overlooked. People didn't know why they were there and what they were supposed to do. And I mean, really kind of scary stuff. So there is opinion, public and private opinion in this mission area and outside of it. And now what you will see is that this public opinion can either decide to ignore the crisis, you know, many crises are not paid much attention to, mm -hmm. or to demand action. Mm -hmm. And if there is a sort of movement to um, act to stop a particular um, war or brewing war or aggression against one ethnic group by another, etc., policy pressure is created. And this pressure affects uh, governments, NGOs and the United Nations if it becomes, you know, an issue before the Security Council. And then, um, again, we can almost close the loop because these governments that are supposed to deal with this, I mean, the security crowd is, is there to maintain international peace and security. That is, that's its primary purpose. Um, if then it takes no action and countries try to downplay the crisis because they have a stake in this continuing or not stopping the war, then nothing happens or very little happens. And we go back and the crisis festers or, you know, becomes worse. Or if individual governments take an initiative to stop it and succeed in convincing uh, the rest of their 15 members on the Security Council, then an organization or a, an operation in this case can be launched. Okay, so the media, um, if there's adequate media coverage, that is, can affect public opinion, which in turn can create policy pressure, governments, NGOs, and uh, potentially the UN as well. So the, the media is clearly a powerful tool. Let's turn to actually implementing a media campaign. What are some of the main obstacles and considerations for launching a successful campaign? Um. Well, there are the, you know, the problems that we already touched upon, whether you have the capacity to have your own media um, and information broadcasting, et cetera, yeah. program in place. And in developing countries in crisis areas, that often is a technical issue too. But I think the UN has done pretty well now with the radio programs and using its own radio programs, because in Africa, radio is still an important tool. But I think the first thing one should always look at, and this goes for not just for the UN, I think for anyone going into another country to work there and to try to affect change, you have to look at the information 
um, and education environment and analyze it very thoroughly. And that gets down to things like how many people not only can read and write, because that's not always a given either, but how many people actually follow the news from which channels? Mm. Do they just have the word of mouth type of a, th a thing? Do they get their news in headliners on their telephones? Do they watch the evening television program by the government or whoever happens to have one established in that country? And which are the most effective channels of communication? This sort of analysis has to be done very early on. And if you don't do it thoroughly, you don't know how to reach people. Mm. And you don't know how to really persuade people. This is all about a positive form of persuasion that I distinguish from, you know, the old style propaganda that, that <laughs> sort of by now looks like a really very much 20th century concept, right? People don't even use the term anymore right now. But the, the, the sort of information and education program that can convince people that it is in their best interest to have free and fair elections to have international observers there and what the functions are of these people. That's, I think, something that now a lot of communication students and um, others you know, in the PR world are, are used to doing. But it doesn't mean that they necessarily do it when they come to a foreign environment because often they don't understand the languages. And I, I don't just mean English and French. I mean the local languages that are really spoken, mm. um, the tribal languages or the popular languages that no foreign or very few foreigners understand um, or that are so different, say, you know, the, the Haitian language, uh, which is not, you know, really, really uh, French in, in the way they speak it in Paris. And, and how does information then travel in those languages among the majority of the, the people. That's really the, the crux of the matter. A lot of people aren't, aren't equipped to do that. You know, you just don't walk into another country without the basic tools. You know, you have to start recruiting interpreters, translators. You're dependent on locals, not just drivers, but people who really can not just speak the language, but also look for the critical terms, you know, is this hate media, or propagating hate media, or is it uh, just a harmless little local uh, disagreement? So this is one of the overall challenges, I, I think. But um, apart from that, I think you have to be very much aware that you will always be a foreigner, that you, uh, especially if you know, you're, you're not from the same sort of racial group that's predominant in that country. You will look different, you will act different, your clothes are different, everything, and they react to you differently. So people have certain hopes, aspirations, expectations of, you know, an international operation there. It's not just a bread and butter type of thing. And uh, you have to convince them that you're there and, and it's for a good good cause. And you're not just there to exploit them, but you're there to help them. And then you leave. That's also important. You know, you don't just sort of plan to stay there for the next 20 years. <laughs> right. That, I think, uh, is one of the mistakes that the international community keeps making in some countries in mm -hmm. Afghanistan, but also in Cyprus, you know, and other places. Yeah. And then, of course, as you mentioned already, the avoidance of being scapegoated and the um, attempt to early on deflect those who really do not want peace. There are people who have no interest in, in peace in that country because they are either armistice or they make a lot of money out of uh, serving even international troops. Um, and... Um, We've seen this in several countries where the UN did have a rather more advanced um, operation, like where the disarmament of combatants took place, which is a very sensitive issue. It was done in, um, with the contrast in, in Central America, for example. They did not want it talked about. 
They did hand over their arms and the arms were destroyed by UN peacekeepers, but they did not want us to talk about it. We were not even supposed to you know, announce this as a big sort of PR campaign. So these things are tricky, you know, mm. oh. and they need a lot of uh, what we in German call Fingerspitzengefühl. <laughs> Which loosely translates to what? <laughs> uh, well, <laughs> What, what is fingerspitzengefühl in English? It, you, you have it at your fingertips or your okay. gut level or that or a, a touchy sort of uh, uh, approach. Gotcha. And um, yeah. Yes. Um, th- this is great. I like getting into the the steps there. You're, you're sort of first saying the primary step here is to do an analysis, which has a lot of challenges. And you're looking at the channels that are used, the education. Let's back up to the objectives then of, you know, undertaking one of these initiatives in the first place. You mentioned expectations, and then you also mentioned um, deflecting uh, spoilers uh, to the process. Any other objectives of undergoing this this campaign in the first place? What are you trying to achieve? Oh, uh, I guess uh, consent as well. <laughs> That's what you mentioned. Yeah, that. I mean, yes. you're, you, you ideally want the majority of the population to support what you're there to do. And if if you don't have that support of the majority of the population, then I think you have a real problem. And it's not something you can just sort of, uh, in a short period of time, um, change. It's uh, create, you know, these are expectations and and, uh, concepts that people have for any foreign intervention that aren't necessarily positive. You know, they've had experiences in the past from the colonial days, Mm -hmm. from people who just came there to exploit their resources, uh, from people who cheated them, and on and on and on. Mm -hmm. It's um, something that that it's a sort of trust that needs to be built. Right. And you mentioned that radio is a a popular communication channel that the UN will actually have its own radio stations now. The message has to be trusted, whatever is going on that radio station. Do you have any ways of measuring trust? Is that something that uh, you keep the pulse of? Is there any way to gauge that? Well, there's usually evaluations done. And people also, in some UN peacekeeping missions, they, they hired external uh, public opinion monitors, people who would go around asking questions about how do you feel about the UN doing this or that or the other. Okay. And I remember it was done by uh, some people at Yale University in Ivory Coast, for example, and Liberia. And in the Ivory Coast, I recall there there was a lot of opposition to the UN being there for a variety of reasons. And they, at some stage, they also attacked UN peacekeepers, etc. So obviously, that was not done well. Personally feel after elections have taken place and the country is beginning to get its own, its own system in place, the internationals should slowly begin to withdraw and not hang on forever, you know? Mm-hmm. And um, because people then ask, why are they still here? What are they doing? How are they supporting us? They live, you know, they live in fancy villas and we still starve and that sort of thing. Yeah, I think that sort of trust and the um, reliance on, you know, the goodwill of the people is is essential. What can you do about sort of rumors and, and word of mouth? Um, that, that's a powerful way to transmit information. Do you sort of attempt to address that through the, the, the radio or um, what can you do in those situations? Yeah, very difficult. I think in the case of rumors... Like Haiti was a case in point, right, where rumors travel by word of mouth and and it's not something that an international person usually finds out about until it's too late. There was a case like that in Haiti where the UN was accused of having brought cholera to the country. This was about 2009 or 10 or so. And it became actually an international scandal at the time. The UN did not handle it well. First, there was the usual denial and can't be. And it was one particular contingent, military contingent from a part of Asia that was supposed to have brought it in. 
And then after many denials and all of that, they finally had to admit that it probably was brought in by the Nepalese battalion. And, you know, this was not handled <laughs> well at all. It should have been immediately investigated. And if so, you know, they needed to, you know, repair the damage, but to spend months denying it. And then uh, after several months, finally being forced to admit that it did take place was terrible. So I think the UN image in a case like that is, is at stake. And of course, when it comes to military uh, components, they're not accountable to the Secretary General or to anyone in the Secretariat where they're accountable to their own national authorities. So this is another problem, um, that there is really no disciplinary measures. Right. So w- without that, the disciplinary measures, it must add another layer of complexity to the challenge of creating trust. Um, now, I, I know we're almost out of time here, but before you go, can you give an idea of what types of messages go into UN radio broadcast? What typically is being broadcasted? Well, a mix of things. And I only participate in, in, in one, and I wrote about uh, my book about two or three of them. Um, in in the case of Namibia, where we created the messages ourselves, it, we we thought it was so important that it is tailor made to what is happening in the country in the right. transitional period, which after all took almost a, a whole year. That the, the main messages were always the same: free and fair elections, and your vote is secret, and you cannot be penalized for the way you vote, and the elections process itself is one of integrity, and you do not have to fear um, retaliation in whatever way you vote. And that in itself was very important. Right. So radio is a tool to create trust in the electoral process in that situation. Well, there's so much more I'd like to talk about, but I know you have to go, so we'll wrap it up here. It's been really interesting to get this behind-the-scenes look at the evolution of information and communication campaigns in the UN from someone who was involved in creating and implementing them. So uh, thank you very much for that. If anyone would like to learn more about you and your work, uh, where, where can they find you? Well, they can find me on uh www.peacehawks.net and also I'm on LinkedIn and um, Twitter. Wonderful. Uh, well, th- thank you so much, Ingrid. It's been, it's been great. Thank you, Warren. All the best. Bye. Thanks for listening. If you want to hear more from international experts digging into a range of topics on conflict, power, and persuasion, Subscribe to your favorite podcast app or visit us at cn.org. That's C-I-I-A-N dot O-R-G.